The way some doctors prescribe Ozempic and other weight loss peptides is basically malpractice, and health influencers often make things worse by spreading misleading information. Now, I prescribe these medications in my clinic, and when handled correctly, they can be a game changer for patients. I want to ensure you get accurate information about these revolutionary therapies and know what you should expect from a healthcare provider. By the end of this video, you'll be equipped to make a smart decision about whether they're a good option for you or a loved one. Let's start with my charge of malpractice. Now that sounds pretty harsh, but some physicians ignore the guidelines for providing proper care to their patients, and here's how. First, let me briefly tell you about how doctors should be prescribing these medications. The clinical guidelines recommend several steps, and to begin, a doctor should assess a patient's body mass index, their waist circumference, and other health comorbidities. Second, they should discuss weight loss goals, and they should be realistic and specific. Third, a doctor should help patients to select appropriate lifestyle changes to address their weight. This always involves adjusting their diet and increasing exercise. Then they should wait three to six months to see if these changes have helped. In most cases, beginning treatment with medications like Ozempic would only be recommended if a patient's body mass index is above 30 and hasn't met their weight loss goals despite making the recommended lifestyle changes. And it should only be started after making sure that the patient has thoroughly understood the risks and and benefits of GLP-1 medications. But here's what's happening instead. Some doctors are giving out prescriptions for GLP-1 medications after patients fill in a short questionnaire. And if you meet certain qualifications, then they write you a prescription for Ozempic and charge between $50 to $200 per script. They then bank that check every month. Now that is not medicine, that is drug dealing. And many physicians also fail to tell patients about a key aspect of using GLP-1 medications for weight loss. Specifically, they don't tell them that these medications generally need to be used over the long term. Studies show that weight will usually return if patients stop taking them. It's similar to if you stop taking cholesterol medications. The cholesterol simply bounces back up. Now, it's essential for patients to know this so that they can properly weigh the benefits and potential risks of these medications, especially when considering the costs, because these medications are not cheap. Finally, some doctors don't monitor patients who are using GLP-1 medications adequately. Often, it's the same doctors who are quick to prescribe a medication without following the clinical guidelines. Now, at best, they may have a periodic telehealth consultation. But with any medication, there's always the potential for serious side effects that we need to pick up and treat correctly. So in my clinic, I work with patients who are taking GLP-1 medications very closely. We want to be able to spot and respond any potential problems to this treatment right away. GLP-1 medications are a powerful tool, but they need to be used carefully. So if we're considering GLP-1 medications like Ozempic, we need to choose a doctor carefully as well. We should look for someone who's willing to follow the best practices to guard our long-term health. Beginning a prescription medication is a serious decision, and we want someone beside us who will help to equip us and make that choice wisely. Now, at this point, I know some of you might be thinking, if we have to be so cautious about starting GLP-1 medications, is it really safe? And here's where we come to the problem of influencers spreading misinformation. Yes, there are potential adverse effects with Ozempic and similar GLP-1 medications, but there are some serious misconceptions that we need to clear up, and I'll paint a realistic picture of the potential risks and benefits. The first misconception has to do with muscle, and here's the worry, that GLP-1 medications cause us to lose it. But do they? Well, yes, but here's the thing. Losing muscle generally happens when we lose weight. This is true if we just change our diet or take medications or undergo bariatric surgery. And it's because when we lose weight, we're taking in fewer calories than we're using and the body has to make up for that shortfall somewhere. So one of the resources it starts to use is stored fat, but it will tend to break down some muscle tissue as well. So the question that we need to ask is do GLP-1 medications cause us to lose more muscle than other weight loss interventions? Well, let's have a look at how much lean muscle mass is lost by using GLP-1 medications, again such as Ozempic. In the Step 1 study, semaglutide or Ozempic's primary clinical trial, they examined the body composition effects of the treatments in a subgroup of the study. Over 68 weeks, those who took Ozempic lost an average of 16.86% of their weight, and this included a loss of lean muscle mass of 3.61%. So far, this is a number without context. We don't know if that's high or low without comparing it to other weight loss interventions. So let's have a look at another study. This one was specifically designed to see if weight loss affects lean muscle mass, and there were three groups. One group was put on a calorie restriction diet, the second group was diet and exercise, and the
and the third group was just exercise. So what happened? Well, the group on the calorie restriction diet lost about 7% of their weight. This included a lean muscle mass loss of about 2% in the upper body and 4% in the lower body. Now, recall the numbers from the semaglutide or azempic trial. Participants there lost 16.8% of their weight and 3.61% of lean muscle mass. So in the second study, the participants lost 7% of their weight and 2 to 4% of their lean body mass. So comparing the two, the lean muscle mass losses from the semaglutide glutide trial, given the much larger weight loss percentage, were lower. So while the evidence supports the claim that using GLP-1 medications leads to some muscle mass loss, this isn't something unique to this form of weight loss. But I want to highlight one more thing about the study that we've just looked at. It found that the group that used the calorie restricted diet with exercise lost less muscle mass. Instead of 2 and 4%, the numbers were 1% in the upper body and 2% in the lower body. In other words, adding exercise cut the lean muscle mass loss in half. That is exactly why adding resistance training and a high lean protein diet are strongly recommended when undertaking any weight loss program. And here's a second concern people raise about GLP-1 medications, thyroid cancer. Early studies in rodents found that semaglutide could cause a form of thyroid cancer. But rodents and humans are obviously quite different, so the effects seen in the rodent studies often don't show up in human populations. So what evidence do we have from human studies? Well, a recent meta-analysis looked at 10 randomized clinical trials involving over 14,000 people. They concluded that there is no significant risk for thyroid cancer that's associated with semaglutide. Another analysis was broader. It took into account both clinical trials and other kinds of studies. Its conclusion was the same. The next worry is about pancreatitis. Pancreatitis is inflammation of the pancreas, which is an organ that makes digestive enzymes and other hormones. This condition is listed as a possible side effect for semaglutide, but how likely is it? Well, a meta-analysis published last year looked at the existing trials to investigate the adverse effects of GLP-1 medications. The authors found that pancreatitis was no more common among those that were taking those medications compared to those who weren't. What about gallstones? Having problems with your gallbladder, like gallstones, is also listed as a possible side effect. And unlike other issues that we've talked about, studies do show that people taking GLP-1 medications have a higher chance of getting gallstones and other gallbladder problems. But how much greater is the risk? Well, a meta-analysis looked at those using GLP-1 medications, and they found that those who were using those meds had a 27% higher risk of developing a gallstone. Now let's give that some context. Gallstones are actually quite common, an estimated 10 to 20% of Americans will develop them at some point, but interestingly, they're usually symptom-free. So if we take a middle figure of 15% risk in the general population, that increased risk of 27% gives us about a 19% risk. Now that's not a large difference, but is that increased risk worth it? Well, we'll pick that question up in just a minute. First, I want to address one last worry when it comes to GLP-1 medications. You might have heard that they cause mental health problems like depression. So let's have a look at what the evidence says. An analysis of several major trials for semaglutide found that there were no differences in symptoms of depression or suicidal thoughts between those taking the medication compared to those who were taking a placebo. So we've seen that there are some common misunderstandings out there about GLP-1 medications. When it comes to muscle loss, the problem is real but no different compared to other weight loss strategies. Worries about thyroid cancer, pancreatitis and depression appear to be overblown, and from the current evidence, it doesn't appear that these problems show up more often in those taking GLP-1 medications. But with gallstones, the risk is indeed elevated, but it doesn't end up being that much higher. And this is the point where patients that I talk with often feel a bit confused. How should we think about the whole issue of side effects when it comes to these medications? Do we really want to start a medication that may cause health problems? And here is what I tell them, and I'd encourage you to share this video with anyone that you know who is considering these weight loss medications. First, I'm really honest with the fact that some of these side effects with GLP-1 medications are common, and I explain to them that the most common side effects are nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and constipation. But these side effects, they're usually mild to moderate, and for most people, they go away over time as the body gets used to these medications. And as we've already discussed, there are some more serious side effects, like gallstones, that are possible. So these are the risks, and it's important that patients understand them. 
Careful monitoring helps us detect and respond to these problems, but we can't eliminate all of those risks. So is it worth starting these medications? And here is where we need to ask a second question. What are the risks of not taking these medications? Recall that GLP-1 medications are typically only considered if we've got a body mass index of 30 or above, and we know that being overweight is associated with high risks of deaths from all causes. In fact, above a BMI of 25, that risk was about 30% higher for every 5 unit increase of BMI. A high BMI is connected to several health concerns, ranging from heart disease to diabetes. As one study put it, an elevated BMI is connected to almost every category of mortality outcome. So being overweight poses serious risks to our health, and the higher our BMI, the greater those risks. And losing weight can be a challenge. With lifestyle changes alone, people will usually find that they can lose between 5-7% to of their weight, but they often struggle to maintain that weight loss. So if our BMI is above 30, we're likely going to need a more aggressive approach to reach our goals. And this puts the decision about whether to use GLP-1 medications in context. Yes, they have potential risks, but being overweight has risks that are even more serious. Now, it's always going to be up to the individual patient to ultimately decide what is best for their health, and it's the job of physicians like me to give patients all of the information that they need to make that decision wisely. And there's one more piece of information that I talk with my patients about. There's a newer type of medication that's similar to semaglutide or azempic, but with a twist. So GLP-1 medications, they work by mimicking a natural hormone. It bonds to receptors on certain cells and helps to regulate blood sugar and appetite. But this newer medication however, it works on two different receptors at once, and this appears to boost its effectiveness. So according to the results that we've got so far, it looks like it produces an even stronger weight loss effect compared to semaglutide, and this newer medication is called tazepatide, and it goes by the brand names Monjaro and Zepbound. If we're going to consider weight loss medications, it might be worth discussing that option with your doctor as well. But as powerful as our newest weight loss medications are, however, diet is always going to be critical. And as I mentioned earlier, the clinical guidelines tell us to start there and only consider medications once we've tried lifestyle changes. And no medication is ever going to replace a great diet. So even if we're taking medications, we still need to adopt a healthy diet to see long-term results. So what is the best diet for weight loss and health overall? Well, make sure to check out this next video here to discover simple principles for healthy eating backed up by the latest research.